today we'll be covering the next section of uh, Anger and Your Physical Health from the book Managing Your Anger by Neil T. Anderson and Rich Miller. Branching off from the central nervous system is a peripheral nervous system that has two distinct channels. One channel is the somatic nervous system, the system that ner- navigates all our muscular and skeletal movements. It is that which we have violation, volitional control over. Provided we have adequate physical health, we can mentally choose to move our limbs, smile, and speak. Obviously, the somatic nervous system correlates with our will. We don't do anything without first thinking it. The thought-action response may be so rapid that one is hardly aware of the sequence, but it is always there. Involuntary muscular movements do occur when the system breaks down, as is the case with Parkinson's disease. The autonomic nervous system is that which regulates all our glands and correlates with our emotions. We don't have direct volitional control over the functional Uh, functioning of our glands. In the same way, we don't have direct volitional control over our emotions, including the feelings of anger. We cannot will ourselves to like someone who is disgusting. We can choose to do the loving thing on their behalf, even though we don't like them. We cannot simply tell ourselves to stop being angry because we cannot directly manage our emotions that way. When we acknowledge that we are angry, we do have control over how we are going to express it. We can manage our behavior within limits because that is something we have volitional control over. We do have control of what we think, will think and believe. That is what controls what we do and how we feel. Telling angry people that they shouldn't be angry will only produce guilt, defensiveness, rationalization, or retaliation. You will have as much success telling them to stop being angry as they will have trying to keep their uh, autonomic nervous system from functioning. We can, however, be a calming influence so that manage, so they can manage their behavior. A gentle answer turns away truth, uh, turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger, Proverbs 15.1. We could say, I know you are angry right now, but you may have, and you may have a good reason to be. Are you open to sharing with me what that reason is so I can understand? Anger in others is a symptom that must be acknowledged or you will be adding insult to injury. It is important to realize that what is causing the atomic, autonomic nervous system to respond is not the brain and neither is the brain causing us to feel angry. It is the mind and the way it has been programmed. Neither do the circumstances of life or other people make us angry. It is our perception of those people and events and how we interpret them, and that is a functioning of our minds and how they have been programmed. Let's apply that reasoning to the problem of stress. When the pressures of life begin to mount, our bodies try to adapt. Our adrenal glands will excrete hormones into the bloodstream, enabling us to rise to the challenge. If the pressure persists too long, then stress becomes distress, our system breaks down, and we become sick. Why then do some people respond positively to stress while others get sick? Is it because one has superior adrenal glands? Some are physically able to handle more than others, but that is not the primary difference. The primary difference is found in the mind, not the body. Suppose two partners in a business are confronted with one with what one believes is a financial crisis. They just lost a contract they thought would bring them to a new level of prosperity. One partner is not a Christian and has chosen to believe that this new contract would make him successful. Many of his personal goals would be realized, but now his dreams are dashed. He responds in anger to all who try to console him and calls his lawyer to see if he can sue the company who broke the contract. The other partner is a Christian who believes that success is becoming the person God created him to be. He believes that God will supply all his needs. Therefore, this loss has less of an impact on him. Though he would likely be disappointed, he doesn't get angry because he sees this as a temporary setback at work, as a learning experience, and continues to believe that all things work Mm -hmm. together for good to those who trust God. 
Romans 8:28. One of these two partners is stressed out and angry while the other partner isn't. The primary difference between the two men is their belief system, not their external circumstances which are the same, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. Proverbs 23:7. This brings up another important concept. If what we believe does not conform to the truth, then what we believe does not conform to reality. Suppose a man has been employed by the same company for 30 years. His plan is to work another 5 to 10 years with the same company and then retire. The recent recession has resulted in some layoffs, uh, but he believes his job is safe. Then on a Monday morning, he receives an email from his boss where requesting that he comes to his office Friday morning at 10 a.m. Can you imagine what would go through his mind that that week? Why does he want to see me at the end of the week? Are they going to lay me off? If that is what he thinks, he will likely get angry. How can they lay me off after 30 years of service? I'm not going to give them the satisfaction. I'm going to resign. His wife talks him out of it, but on Tuesday and Wednesday, he is struggling with doubts. Well, maybe they aren't going to lay me off. Yeah, they are. No, they're not. Yeah, they are. Now he is feeling anxious. Because he is double-minded, by Thursday morning he has convinced himself he is probably going to get laid off. How am I going to get a job at my age? How will I pay the bills? Now he is depressed because he feels helpless and hopeless. By Friday morning he is an emotional wreck. Reluctantly he enters the office of his boss who says, Congratulations, we are promoting you to vice president. In those five days he has felt anger, anxiety, depression, all as a result of what he has chosen to think none of it based on reality. Current or external events do not trigger our psychological responses, nor is the secretion of adrenaline initiated by our adrenal glands. External events are picked up by our five senses and sent out as a signal to our brains. The mind then interprets the data, choices are made, and that is what determines the signal that is sent from the central nervous system to the peripheral nervous system. The brain cannot function any other way than how it has been programmed. If the data we receive is false or incomplete, then wrong decisions are made and the emotional response is inappropriate. Many civil protests have turned into angry riots, destroying property and taking human lives. Often it is fueled by false or incomplete information supplied by agitators with their own agenda. Few people listen to reason when anger takes over. Some don't want to wait for justice to be served because they don't trust the justice system. Our emotions and actions reveal what we believe. People don't always live according to what they profess, but they do live according to what they to what they believe. James wrote, I will show you my faith by my works. James 2.18 Let's take a look at Jim, our angry driver. He held certain beliefs around himself, life, and what he valued. Chances are his identity and sense of worth were tied into his career. He believed he would be a successful person if he did well on the job and a failure if he didn't. He also had a belief about himself. He was a salesman and a good one, but he was also a father and he held certain Christian values about being a good parent. That afternoon, he didn't want to go back on his word and miss his son's game, but he didn't want to miss a couple of late afternoon calls either that could affect his sales. Was he a salesman first or a father first? Jim made choices that afternoon that had a profound effect on how he felt. He could have entered into his phone the time of his son's game and made it just as important as his business schedule. Then he could have left earlier and avoided all the traffic. His secretary could simply tell his callers that he had an important commitment that he could not miss, but he will do his best to get back to them tomorrow. The stall of traffic didn't make him angry. That was his own emotional response to the choices he had made that day. When I attended my first doctoral class years ago, I was the only professing Christian enrolled. The instructor was an ex-nun who liked to show off her er, liberation from the church with a lot of profanity. I think she was especially delighted to have a reverend in her class whom she would often put on the spot. I saw it as a challenge to my faith, which I was delighted to accept. 
Near the end of the semester, we were asked to share with the class what our term paper would be. I said I was going to do a paper on managing our anger. Another doctoral student protested, you can't do a paper on managing your anger. I, I asked her, why not? Because you don't get angry. She thought it was incredulous that I would choose to do a paper on anger, and she reminded me of it several times. I assured her that I do get at time, at times get angry. Apparently, she would have responded in anger to some of the targeting that I was getting in the class. Our differences became clearer as the semester came to an end. She and her brother, who also attended the class, were members of a cult. Our divergent belief systems became more and more evident as they were tested under fire. What we believe does affect how we respond to the circumstances of our life. If our identity and security are centered in our eternal relationship with God, then the temporal things of life have less of an impact on us. No person can consistently behave in a way that isn't consistent with what they believe about themselves. What do you what you do doesn't determine who you are. Who you determine who you are determines what you do. So who are you? See what kind of love the Father has given to us that mm-hmm. we should be called children of God, and so we are. First John three one. Beloved, this is who are first John, uh, John one twelve. You are God's child. John fifteen fifteen. You are Jesus's chosen friend. Romans five one. You have been justified, forgiven, and have peace with God. 1 Corinthians 6.17 You are united with the Lord and one with Him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.20 You have been bought with a price. You belong to God. 1 Corinthians 12.27 You are a member of Christ's body, part of His family. Ephesians 1.1 1, 1. You are a saint. Ephesians 1.5 You have been adopted as God's child. Ephesians 2.18 You have direct access to God through the Holy Spirit. Colossians 1.14 You have been brought back, redeemed, and forgiven of all your sins. Colossians 2.10 You are complete in Christ. You are secure. Romans 8.1-2 You are free from condemnation. Romans 8.28 You are assured that all things work together for good. Romans 8.31 You are free from any condemning charges against you. Romans 8.35 you cannot be separated from the love of God. 2 Corinthians one twenty one twenty two. You have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. Colossians three three. You are hidden from with Christ in God. Philippians one six. You are assured that the good work of that God has begun in you will be finished. Philippians three twenty. You are a citizen of heaven. Second Timothy one seven. You have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and sound mind. Hebrews 4.16 You can find grace, mercy, in time of need. 1 John 5.18 You are born of God, and the evil one cannot touch you. You are significant. Matthew 5.13-14 You are the salt and the light of the world. John 15.15 You are part of the tr- true vine, joined to Christ, and able to produce much fruit. John fifteen sixteen, You have been chosen by Jesus to bear fruit. Acts 1, 8. You are a personal witness to Christ, of Christ. 1 Corinthians three sixteen. You are God's temple where the Holy Spirit dwells. 2 Corinthians five seventeen to 18. You are at peace with God, and he has given you the work uh, of making peace between himself and other people. You are a minister of reconciliation, 2 Corinthians 6, one. You are God's co-worker, Ephesians 2.6. You were seated with Christ in the, heavenly, in the heavenlies, Ephesians 2.10. You are God's workmanship, Ephesians 3.12. You may approach God with freedom and confidence, Philippians 4.13. You can do all things through, through Christ who strengthens you. And that is my favorite verse, um, a uh, verse that has meant a lot to me uh, growing up and, and throughout my life. So that concludes part two. Um, next uh, will be part three, and that part um, will conclude this section of the book. Uh, so I hope you'll tune into the next one, and uh, thanks for listening.